go into this a little bit because one of the things that's so striking about your books, first of all, all of them are inspiring. All of them you read and you read about these apparently intractable problems and then you break down what can happen. And sometimes it's very practical things, but sometimes it's also uh, deep uh, wisdom. And I think of wisdom as the truth that lies often hidden under some superficial um, misdirection. So mm -hmm. we gain wisdom over time because we say, wait a minute, it may look like it's this, but I've seen this before, it's really that. And a lot of what we have to live with in our culture is people misleading us and then realizing it. And so I'll just I'll give you an example uh, from your book, EcoMind, which I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk mm -hmm. about for a moment. So. Um, we and we found an immediate point because I'd written about this myself in a different way. So uh, the basic uh, truth uh, that's shared in society is that seeing is believing. Hmm. Um, Frankie took a very different approach and I wonder if you could talk about yeah. that because it's the kind of wisdom that I immediately identified with and I think if people had the chance to think it through it would liberate them. So, mm -hmm. so if it's not seeing is believing. What it is. Believing is seeing. Mm. In other words, we humans, and there's so much evidence that with this, that we can't see what we don't expect to see. Mm -hmm. And we expect to see what fits within the frame that we've absorbed, often unconsciously, mm -hmm. in our culture. And I, I'll just tell you a, um, a very homey example of this that I love to share that, that so brings it out. And it was a Thanksgiving morning many years ago, or a handful of years ago, and my job is to get up and make this root vegetable dish because 35 people were coming in the afternoon and I went immediately looking for my Dutch oven that I was gonna bake this thing in and I couldn't find it anywhere and I got really annoyed. I went to the basement, all the drawers. No, 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 where is it, where is it? I started chopping. A few minutes later, I turned around and there it is, except it had a plant in it and I was looking for something to put in the oven. Now this thing is big and red, and I was crazy looking for it, but I didn't see it because I didn't expect to see it as a planter. I expected it to see as something, I usually don't put my plants in the oven, so I couldn't see it. <laughs> so I laughed out loud and thought, there you go, believing is seeing, and, and we see what we expect to see. And so if we, if we want living democracy to emerge, we have to believe it's possible. And we have to be looking for examples of it everywhere and recognizing that yearning inside, it. it's, a, it's a shift of frame. And so that's a, become the theme song of my life. Uh, one of them is this idea of culturally determined filters. And that's where we are stuck right now in this blaming world, in this world of limits that our problem is always scarcity. I guess that's another key theme mm -hmm. that I should bring up yeah, please. Is, is the, Perhaps the single most important takeaway from my early life is that in my 20s, writing a Diet for a Small Planet, that if we see the world as limits, scarcity, there's not enough, and which is a cultural message we're getting, you know, they're not enough handsome men, right? I think of you. Uh, they're not enough, not to mention you. <laughs> Both of you. But you know, that, that idea, the there's, well, that I should help. say there, that one of the myths, you know, they're not of good men. That's, you yeah. know, as you, as you grow up as a woman, oh, you, you, better, you, you better get lucky because there are not enough of them. Or, you know, you name it, there are not enough good jobs now. And now, for my granddaughters, not enough good schools. You've got to get into Harvard or you're toast. And yeah. that scarcity scare, you know, is just with us all the time. Now, some things are true, like parking places in Boston. <laughs> but um, in general, that is this frightening, uh, and that makes us um, competitive always with others and everything. So this frame of scarcity then is uh, everywhere that I have been trying to dissolve and um, replace it with this sense of a world in which we are all connected and continuous change, and so therefore we're all co-creators. Nothing is fixed and scarce. And getting away from this limits notion um, that, oh, we've used up the Earth's limit, you know, we've hit the limits. And in EcoMind, I say, no, it's a much better way of seeing is that we have, we're perversely aligned with the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. And that's much less scary because we can align with nature and then there's enough. We know we're already producing enough food, uh, but we can have enough clean air and we can, you know, I mean, the, 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 the shift of frame is what I've been trying to do. And, all my life, and starting with 
the frame of scarcity and reframing that? I, I'd like just to build on yeah. that for a second. Um, for me, um, following on some of the same thinking, way back when I was at Yale Divinity School, I had a professor who taught Biblical Hebrew. And one of the things she brought up was the story of Adam in Genesis actually naming animals. Mm -hmm. And what she uh, talked about in the context of Judaism was the, um, the important link between the word and reality. So the human capacity to name something gave a human being the ability to understand it and control it. So I worked out a little theory that first you had to, to name it, and if you didn't name it, you had uh, trouble. Then um, you gradually could understand it, and then you could try to understand correlations, like, well, if I do this, and that happens, and that gave you mastery up until the point where you ran out of gas again and had to think up a new name. Right. And so many of this, uh, uh, pro so many of these problems. So, for example, in the world of sustainability and working with business, you know, they're working under an old frame based on different assumptions about the planet and about the uh, process of creation and manufacturing. And as a result, they literally, in some cases, can't hear the new frame. Um, and that's a hu and, and we've seen this many times, and I see you as someone who has kept going after using, I mean, starting with the older frame and saying, but look how much more it could be. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I think, uh, this is a, a major problem. And to give one quick example, in all our discussions of policy, we talk about, you know, public uh, institutions and private institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a whole missing middle category which is the corporate institution, which is not public government, but it is certainly a lot more powerful than a private institution. And that because we insist on not talking everything about in, a di uh, in this diagram of two, we miss the importance of three, and therefore our analysis is just fundamentally broken. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you for to that. To build on that, yeah. um, part of the show is articulating the world we want in order to get there. Yeah. So that's been such a key element you've integrated in me and Anne, your wife has built on the scarcity model, very emulating what you've been saying and stuff like that. It's very inspiring to just be part of this conversation. I would ask you to take it to the point of articulating to our audience what our food ecosystem could look like so we could start building towards it. What would you know the 21st century food ecosystem have that we don't have now or what are the, some of the policies we need or what were the structures we need in order to build towards that sustainable food ecosystem which is built on food as a right? Mm -hmm. Well, food in some way, the challenge of food um, is in some ways absolutely parallel to the challenge of every sector of our society, that um, because power is increasingly concentrated in a very few players, and the way that they view their goal is, you know, the, you've got to get me on the right language here, but return to their what you know, their employee, their their uh, their uh, shareholders, maximizing shareholder wealth, maximizing shareholder wealth. Thank you. Uh, that what we've seen in uh, this model of what I call corporate chemical agriculture. I don't like the term conventional agriculture or industrial. Even it doesn't really capture what's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that that um, the challenge is that we know that what is required is alignment with the regenerative power of, of nature and uh, that this model of uh, the, the corporate model is about products of selling selling products that are monopoly controlled in the case of say genetically modified seeds and now we see with Bayer slash Monsanto what's the consequences of that that it was never the, these products were never fully tested in by any means and they were monopoly controlled so that that um, the, the we've created a food system that is increasingly concentrated in a few hands and that leads then to is part of a system that it, that um, disempowers people from being able to have the wherewithal to buy the food they need and is violating the most basic rules of regenerative agriculture which is you know using compost, returning nutrients to the earth, uh, minimal tillage that disrupts the natural microorganisms on which, which makes a healthy soil, and on and on and on. So, and contributes to climate change in a very significant way. Um, so, um, 
I, I, I think that agriculture, like any sector we could turn to, so, so is uh, so clearly violating all of my three principles, dispersion of power, transparency, and mutual accountability, then we end up with a food system that is making literally, uh, literally making us sick. Mm -hmm. That most non-communicable diseases in the world now are linked to our diet, you know. Every other species feeds itself what it's going to make it healthy. Uh, and we have gone, you know, in a, in a direction that made food into a health hazard. So it's, it's, it's just, I still think that food is a very powerful learning tool <laughs> uh, for what is healthy. And um, uh, I certainly felt that it's, you know, learning about whole foods and a plant-centered diet has been an incredible value to me personally. And so I, I don't, I've, I could go on and on, but did well, I answer your question? Did. That was yeah. but, but let me add one thing that connects to something you said before, which is the entire corporate marketing culture, whether it's about food or anything else, is about making people worry about scarcity. Like there's only so many of these things, and uh, so either it's you can't get the basics, or you certainly can't get the fancy stuff. The fancy stuff is only for fancy people. You're not fancy enough. So building in right. uh, uh, a sense of lack of self-worth, of, of um, all of the negative feelings that get us to hunger for something else from the outside, all of these things are produced by a, uh, a system of capitalism that just keeps pounding on more, 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 more growth, more objects, more consumption. And um, of course, we do have some of those feelings, but this and exploits that right. systematically. And, and processed foods, which processed food. it precisely to appeal to our more, um, you know, addictive, right. high salt, high fat, high, highly processed, and so, yeah, it's it's a very it's 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 built into the system the suffering that we're experiencing. So today. let's let's move into. I mean, I'm just so impressed. I have not read every one of your books, but I've read quite a few of them, and I particularly would like to talk about this most recent book, uh, Daring Democracy, which is filled with uh, so many wonderful insights and uh, written with Adam uh, Eichen, is how he pronounced his last name, a, a young man written at very high speed, uh, amazing how you, well you We were motivated this. after the election. Issue. Well, yeah, so maybe you want to talk a little bit about the themes in here. One theme I'd like to bring up that I re still remember having the conversation with you and with Dick about something we've already mentioned, which is these three, uh, three elements that tend to define how we and when we are willing to engage. So the first one, here you call it, so you call it power, meaning, and connection. Mm -hmm. Initially, you were using the term agency. It's just a little more technical, but I think you made the right decision. But agency is, or power, is the sense that you actually have the ability right. to affect something. So could you walk us through the power, meaning, and connection? Because honestly, as I, once I had heard those ideas, I began applying them uh, to many situations mm -hmm. and to see that many people don't feel they have power, meaning, or connection. Could you talk about that right. for a little while? This is such a, I really want you to go out and buy this book because it's a, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, and short. Frankie yes. and I are into yes, short it's books very now. Readable. Yeah, so. um, thank you, thank you. For me, that, I, I don't it, remember how long ago it was, quite a long time ago, but uh, that I came to those three essentials. And mm -hmm. now I, I describe these as the essence of human dignity. Mm -hmm that humans didn't evolve as couch potatoes and whiners. We evolved as doers or we wouldn't be here, right? And problem solvers, and we need, we need to have a sense of that we count, that we have voice, that, and that is, you know, when you don't, when you feel that someone has dissed you, you know, that your dignity has been, it's when that you feel you're not heard. Mm -hmm. We need to know that we are heard. Mm -hmm. And we need also, I think, meaning beyond our own survival. For some people it is, the meaning of just knowing that they're bringing up healthy children, and that's wonderful, but if possible to feel that we have meaning uh, in the larger, you know, evolution of our species, it, the historic meaning, that we're part of a historic betterment of the earth. So meaning, and also then uh, 
we need to feel a sense of connection to others. Very few of us we are, can make it on our own, that we are happiest in community. And all the studies now show that you know, happiness is so much related to the quality of our relationships, more than money, more than job, anything. It's feeling that we are connected to others, and if possible, connected to others in common purpose. And so, for example, you, know, you hold up that book. That book was really born uh, on a march, on a march between uh, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., uh, where Adam and I became friends. Um, um, he he's, was in his early 20s at that point, but we became friends marching together and, were, and then sat in on the Capitol steps in perhaps the largest uh, demonstration, largest number of arrests on the Capitol steps, certainly for democracy reforms in 2016. But it was life-changing for me for, for one reason. I mean, I was expressing values I'd had for a long time. Why was it life-changing? Because I knew I was no longer alone. Yes. <laughs> I was not alone. I was part of a movement, a historic movement. And that was, <laughs> uh, there's this picture of me that, with my hand up in the air, my son noticed I had a pen in it. <laughs> it wasn't a fist, it was a pen, Mom, you know, a writing pen. Um, but um, right before that moment where that picture was taken, I said to Adam, this is the happiest day of my life. And of course, I meant my public life. Uh, but because I felt like, oh, we've done this together. Uh, in this long march, and um, so I, I, those are the touchstones of my life. Does how does any democracy or any you know any group how does it afford those essential needs? How does it in, allow us to feel a sense of agency? Um, you know, what meaning beyond just our own survival does it have the potential to offer us? And what connection? And I. I think now, back to your naming and the importance of naming, mm -hmm. that in this book, Adam and I had to battle a little bit with our publisher. But we had to, we were insisting that the word democracy and movement be capitalized. So it's a capital D, a capital M, because we wanted to say, okay, this is real. We had just experienced it, and we wanted other people to know that there was really a capital D, capital M movement that they could participate in and, and have the same kinds of life-changing moment from just being <gasps> overwhelmed by all the complexities of all of our multiple problems to feeling, yes, it is complex, but there is a pathway in which I can make a difference. You want to talk, uh, excuse me, quickly yeah. about the website that allows oh, thank people you. to uh, Yeah, to, uh, we are in the process, question. still in the process of creating. It will be called democracymovement.us. Uh, we will have a beta form. Uh, could I give our Email sure, address, yeah. 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 Because if you, if any we'll of you, put it up on the if any of you listening want to, uh, I really need help in this. This is the idea of one hub, one platform where people, no matter who they are, with very quickly they could say, "Oh my gosh, so much is going on in this democracy movement. I want to be part of that." And then we'll have an interactive map where you can, wherever you are, you can see organizations. You can, ideally, we're going to have be able to, to um, I, I think of a democracy buddy, we're calling them mentors, but democracy mentor where you could actually talk to a real person and not just an email address. Um, but it's one spot that would be uh, uh, that moment where people would say, prove positive, there is a democracy movement. So it covers voting rights, uh, resisting voting suppression. It covers getting money out of politics, big money control out of politics and equal voice, so it deals with gerrymandering, which leaves some people more of power <laughs> than others. Um, so that's, that's been a dream of ours for a couple years, and we're just about to do the beta, but just info at smallplanet.org, info at smallplanet.org, that will come to our office, and if you, we definitely need helpers, and just feedback is help. But if you, you want have to give the uh, ultimate website? The uh, ultimate website is democracymovement.us, democracymovement.us. So um, that'll be really the campaign will be in the fall to, to, to make it uh, just a go-to place. And it'll be new. So, you, you know, you could have one, you go every week and you get the latest thing and a place where you can pledge to act and then come back and say, you did it. Right. You know?